when John Winthrop lost the 1636 election, it wasn't because of controversy or disapproval. By then, Connecticut was essentially independent from the Massachusetts Bay Colony, and most of his greatest detractors had relocated. He lost only because of the overwhelming and intense popularity of one of his opponents, a man named Henry Vane. You're listening to the American History Podcast with Sarah Tungsalvola, the show exploring who we are and why by tracing American history from the 17th century to the 20th. Henry Vane had arrived in Massachusetts just a few months earlier, carrying the patent for the Saybrook Colony. Just 23, he had been immediately embraced by New Englanders, and he was even invited to sit with the magistrates at the church in Boston where he settled. In a way, this embrace was a practical move. Vane was a good friend of Lord Sayenseal. His father was a member of King Charles's Privy Council, and the king himself had personally granted young Vane permission to settle in Massachusetts for three years. He was their best chance of countering Laud and Gorges's influence, but the colony's love of Vane was also personal. Vane had an understated charisma which drew people to him. He dressed plainly and had a very solemn and sedate manner, as Puritan thought was appropriate. But he was also naturally attractive, and more than looks, he had a refined and intellectual air, which was rare in Massachusetts. He was a prolific writer, although most of his works were so convoluted and dull that few could understand him. And even David Hume pronounced them unintelligible and devoid of common sense. But Vane was pious, charming, and respected, so much so that even dedicated royalists would speak highly of him after the English Civil War. Milton addressed a sonnet to him, and Massachusetts was very eager to get him involved. Early in 1636, Vane and Hugh Peters had held a meeting to smooth the factional differences between Winthrop and Dudley, and that just cemented Vane's popularity. So in the 1636 election, just a few weeks later, Vane was elected governor and Winthrop was his deputy. There's actually a somewhat interesting anecdote and side note from the same general court meeting in which John Cotton had gotten a letter from a group of Puritan nobles like Warwick, Say and Seal, and Brooke, who were considering relocating to Massachusetts, but that they had demanded a system of hereditary power to be implemented in New England before they'd move. The leaders discussed the proposed changes and ultimately decided to implement a system of hereditary honor, but not power, and said that a certain number of magistrates would be chosen for life. The peers decided that the proposal wasn't good enough and that they'd stay home instead. But back on topic, Vane got down to the business of governing, and with style. His natural culture and his time spent at court had given him a sense of stately formality, and when he went out for official business or to church, four sergeants would form a guard to walk before him, carrying halberds. And he was a pretty decent diplomat, which was valuable in the highly charged years leading up to the English Civil War. Just a couple weeks after his election, he held a meeting with the 15 ship's commanders, saying that he wanted to smooth relations between the two groups. There had been two tense exchanges between the colonists and mariners since Vane had been elected, and though he'd smoothed each one out, he wanted a more permanent solution. In the first incident, the lieutenant stationed at Castle Island had insulted the master of a ship owned by the Earl of Strafford. This was the first time that such a thing had happened in New England, and it definitely looked like it was directed at one of the king's highest-ranking and most controversial advisors. The master demanded a public apology, and Vane commanded the lieutenant to give one. 
Aboard another ship, though, just a few days later, a man named Miller started telling his shipmates that New England was filled with rebels and traitors because they wouldn't fly the king's colors at Castle Island. Now, Miller didn't even know that the fortification had been built in order to facilitate rebellion against the king. Vane asked that the ship's master deliver Miller to the colony for punishment, and he did, but the rest of the crew was ready to revolt. The master explained the situation to Vane and asked that Miller be given back to him to pacify his crew, and Vane agreed as long as Miller would publicly acknowledge the offense which he did. So when Vane met with the masters, he told them he wanted them to be open with him any time that they took offense at something the colonists did. And the masters replied that they wanted to see the king's colors at Castle Island. Vane said that they didn't have a flag to fly at their fort, and the masters offered to give them one of their own. Vane agreed saying that even if the colonists considered the cross idolatrous and would never put it on their own standard, the fort was technically the king's, so if they gave them the flag, they'd fly it, but the, they had their own requests. The colonists would like any ships coming into New England to either anchor at Castle Island or send a boat ahead to signal that they were friends and if they were selling goods, to deliver an invoice to the governor, who would then have 24 hours to reject it, and said that he'd like all mariners to go back to their boats after sunset unless they were on necessary business. And the ship's masters agreed to his request, too. This is a good example of what Vane was capable of. Having good relations with the mariners was important, and he'd curbed an issue affecting relations before it got out of hand and at a time when it was only likely to get worse. In many ways, Vane seemed to have the makings of a great governor. But the day after he was elected, a man named John Wheelwright arrived in America. Wheelwright had been ministering privately in England for years, having been silenced for nonconformity before Laud became archbishop. He finally followed his in-laws, the Hutchinsons, to America. Unbeknownst to anyone that spring, within a year, Vane, Anne Hutchinson, and Wheelwright would find themselves at the center of one of the most famous conflicts in the history of colonial New England. The Hutchinsons had followed John Cotton from Boston, England to Boston, Massachusetts. Anne, in particular, had been captivated by him, and Cotton liked her, too. She was a skilled nurse and childbirth advisor, and, like Vane, she was known for her refined manner, intellectual acuity, and charisma. She'd been living in America for years at this point, and she'd been holding meetings for the women of Boston to discuss Cotton's sermons. At first, they were meant to help people who hadn't been able to attend the sermons to get caught up, and she quickly got a 60 to 80 regular attendees. The problem was that as her meetings got popular, she'd started to preach her own opinions and beliefs, and then to critique the other ministers in the colony. Her beliefs had already been noted as unorthodox, and her admission to the Boston church had even been delayed when one of the other passengers aboard her ship warned the magistrates about her deviant opinions. The groups gave her a platform to preach her opinions, and she started to take the role of a minister conducting a weekly religious review. She was also the first person to challenge most of the other ministers in the colony on their beliefs. For a long time, Cotton supported Hutchinson's work. She was one of his most intelligent parishioners, and she was actually helping both men and women to understand one of the most complicated and important parts of his theology. Her criticisms of the colony's other ministers were growing more and more personal, though. And her target was set squarely on Boston's teacher or pastor, John Wilson. 
Wilson didn't even realize how much Hutchinson disliked him for a long time, and he happily joined in Cotton's encouragement of her meetings. He fit the New England mold a bit better than Bain or Hutchinson, a bit coarser, more matter-of-fact, and less sympathetic, not particularly quick-witted, nor a talented public speaker, and stern to the point of being unrelenting. Hutchinson had already been feuding with Wilson for a while by the time that Wheelwright arrived in New England. She led a walkout during one of Wilson's sermons with a group of women turning their backs on their minister, though they made excuses for leaving so that their contempt couldn't be proven. The group had also interrupted Wilson's sermons to challenge him, and when Wheelwright arrived, Hutchinson suggested that he should replace Wilson, but the idea was rejected. Vane, however, soon declared his support of Hutchinson, and this just supercharged her efforts. Soon, virtually everyone in the Boston church was on their side, with only Wilson and Winthrop proposing the movement. Empowered by her strength, Hutchinson began to say that Wilson wasn't an able minister of the New Testament, and her party also got a new name, the Opinionists. At this point in time, no one outside of Boston really knew about the controversy, which would come to be known as the Antinomian Controversy or the Free Grace Controversy. Bain's declaration of support wasn't particularly controversial, and no one outside of Boston even knew what was happening. Hooker and Shepard had disagreed with some of Cotton's theology, but they'd moved to Connecticut and diffused the situation. A couple of members of the Roxbury Church had been attending Hutchinson's meetings, but for the most part, there were just some rumors of odd things happening in Boston. This was 17th century America, and news traveled slowly. That wouldn't remain the case, but before we go on to discuss how the crisis unfolded, it's important to take a minute to look at the intellectual and theological issues at stake. Calvinism, as you probably know, revolved around the idea that people couldn't save themselves in any way. God alone could save souls, and humans were completely passive in that. Most famously, that led some Calvinists to argue the concept of predestination, that only an elect few were destined for heaven, but that was just one facet of a complicated issue. Another question is where the law factored into the equation at all. Traditionally, Christians believed that the law was meant to lead souls to Christ, to illustrate man's need for salvation so that he could understand the importance of the sacrifice on the cross. Calvinists like Cotton preached that fear of the law was one of the truest tests of salvation, but antinomians rejected the law entirely. The very term antinomianism was etymologically derived from antagonism, meaning opposition to the law. The movement had been founded by Taylor-turned-preacher and Luther-disciple-turned-opponent John Agricola, and it quickly joined Anabaptism as a movement marked by its extreme radicalism. Like Brown, Agricola had later renounced the movement which sprung from his teachings, but his followers remained. Antinomians argued that focusing on the law gave man some part to play in his own salvation. This was known as a covenant of works, and the preaching of a covenant of works had been a major accusation leveled against Catholics and Arminians. If you listen to Antinomianism's opponents, in Europe the movement had been marked by libertines who used the idea of predestination as license to sin, saying that if their actions didn't matter anyway, they might as well have fun. Intellectually, though, that wasn't the core of the issue. Saying that a man played some part in his salvation both raised and lowered the standards of grace, lowering the importance of divine sanctification, but also making it impossible for men to 
to know whether or not they were saved. English Puritans had already separated themselves from what they considered the covenant of works of the Catholics and Arminians and average Anglicans, but New England pastors told people to prepare themselves for salvation. People must prepare their hearts before they could be saved, they said. But at the same time, they told people that no matter what they did, God's mercy could be denied in the end. Hutchinson's opinionists argued that preparation was a doctrine of works, which cheapened grace. They said that preparation and predestination were mutually exclusive. They said that human hearts couldn't awaken at all until Christ made an opening for himself. The changes in heart and personality, which most Puritans called a prerequisite to salvation, were actually signs of it. The standard Puritan doctrine was the worst of both worlds, both cheapening grace and taking away people's hope. If contrition and humiliation weren't signs of salvation, there was no assurance of faith, and that was just depressing. The doctrine, they said, would lead people both into pride and then into despair, and at the end, the average person would be even farther from grace than they started. This is a fairly small theological detail, but it was one with massive implications. Historians who have sided with Winthrop and Wilson have tended to dismiss the controversy as being more minor than commonly perceived and said that the real reason the controversy happened at all was that the Puritans' intellectual energy was all funneled into theological debate because they largely refused to engage with secular books and plays. Winthrop didn't, and that's why he managed to stay a more moderate course. I have to say, though, that I don't really think it's as simple as that. Theologically, the implications of non-opinionist Puritan theology were massive, and spoiler alert, the Puritans in New England did end up with a uniquely hopeless variant of Calvinism. The difference also had practical implications. New England pastors like Hooker were admitting people to full church membership and therefore full colony membership on the basis of their actions. On the other hand, people who opposed Cotton's ideas said that his opinions would make the unity of the country, a unity which Winthrop felt was more important than anything, almost impossible to achieve. Puritans didn't believe in miracles or revelations, just divine providence. This again had a very practical application. If miracles or revelations were considered legitimate, then anyone in New England could disrupt the status quo by claiming to be one of God's prophets. The Puritans wanted to form a theocracy, and they didn't want a group of rabble-rousers questioning the sanctity of God's mouthpiece. Unity was absolutely incompatible with individual thought, and miracles and revelations encouraged individual thought. Lack of unity threatened the state more than it threatened religion, and the state was already on shaky ground. So the really funny core of the issue is that in 1637, the Massachusetts Puritans had effectively created a microcosm of old world theological conflict. There were no Catholics or Arminians or run-of-the-mill Anglicans, but Puritans wanted a society in which religion and civil government were interlinked, and to achieve that, they had to take some of the exact positions that they had opposed in England. Pushing a theology which emphasized works and evaluating people's piousness based on outward actions helped to maintain political stability. And this created a rift in New World Puritans. Some people took the place of the old 
high church people implementing a distinctly Calvinist version of regulating and evaluating external actions, while others continued to fight against that just as much in the new world as they had in the old. The comparison wasn't lost on Massachusetts colonists either. Winthrop knew that he was dangerously close to being accused of Arminianism, and he had to tread extremely carefully. He even destroyed a number of letters from his correspondence with other Massachusetts leaders around this time. He was totally overpowered in Boston, and those letters were explaining the situation and asking for external help. And he got that help. The other town's ministers were firmly on his and Wilson's side, and in October, the general court arranged for all of the Massachusetts ministers to go to Boston for a conference with the colony's religious and political leaders. At the conference, they first established their common ground. They could agree that sanctification helped to evidence salvation, and they could agree that people who were sanctified did enter into a union with the Holy Ghost. But they disagreed on the extent of that union. That wasn't an insurmountable difference. However, at the meeting, the opinionists again raised the idea of Wheelwright joining the Boston clergy, and Winthrop again opposed it. This was the first real taste that most people had gotten of Boston's conflict. Winthrop said that they didn't know Wheelwright well enough to make him a minister, and he seemed to have dissenting opinions, and the church was already well-stocked with able clergy. Vane responded emphatically, saying that he marveled at Winthrop's statements, and then he quoted Cotton to support Wheelwright's teaching. Cotton got a bit uncomfortable and said that Wheelwright should explain his own theology instead of just using his words, and Wheelwright spoke, but not well enough to disprove Winthrop's points. So he wasn't appointed to the Boston church, but he was given a preaching position at Mount Wollaston, a rural area just outside of Boston, on the site of Thomas Morton's old Marymount. The Mount had been one of the last places settled near Boston, and ten miles away it was far enough that getting to Boston on Sundays was very difficult. It was too rural and too close to town to form a church of its own, though, so its residents were in a place that was somewhat left out of ordinary religious activities. They were very eager to have a Puritan preacher come to them. So this was great for them, and they jumped at the opportunity, but it did absolutely nothing to diffuse the situation in Boston. Hutchinson was incensed that the other ministers of Massachusetts had supported Wilson and declared that they were no better than he was. None were able ministers of the New Testament. They were all under a covenant of works, legalists to a man, and Vane was right beside her. Together, taking all of Cotton's beliefs to new extremes with a level of detail that many in Boston didn't even fully comprehend. Vane and Winthrop, governor and deputy, also entered into a personal battle at this point. This made Winthrop an incredibly popular figure in the rest of Massachusetts, where people saw him as the champion of the true faith, clergy, and order, and the only man in Boston who had remained faithful. Vane, on the other hand, was seen throughout the rest of the colony as the sower of the seeds of dissent in God's vineyard. Vane's popularity in Boston wasn't enough, he was governor of the whole colony, and he was also young, inexperienced, and now extremely unpopular. He had thrown himself enthusiastically into a popular movement that he agreed with, but now he found that that movement was actually was actually deeply unpopular in the majority of his jurisdiction. Plus, it was clear that a war with the Pequots was coming. He was in over his head, and he knew it. 
In December, just a little over a month after the conference ended, Vane told the magistrates that he wanted to resign his post and return to England. He said he'd gotten letters from England urging him to return home and saying that his financial future would be jeopardized if he didn't. He showed the letters to a handful of the magistrates and they agreed that he should be allowed to return immediately, but that the letters weren't fit to show the entire court. They called for a full meeting of the general court to arrange for his departure, and the next morning the court met, and one of the magistrates made a speech expressing the deep regret that the colony felt at losing such a capable governor at a time of such great peril. In response to this, Vane burst into tears and started to gush he said that he wouldn't have left if it were just a matter of material well-being. He would rather risk everything he owned than to leave the colony in such a dangerous situation, but God would judge them for their divisions and dissensions, and if his leaving would prevent that, it was best for him to resign his post and return to England for a while, and it was for that reason that he was leaving." The court listened to his teary testimony, and they let him calm down for a while, and then they responded. Well, if that's your reason for leaving, you're not going anywhere. Thanks for listening. If you have any opinions, thoughts, or theories about anything we've discussed in the show, I'd love to hear from you either on Facebook or Twitter. And you can find those links at the website, AmericanHistoryPodcast.net, as well as links to first-hand accounts and things. See you next week.